Well, good morning, everybody. Hope you had a good weekend this past weekend. And as we kind of enter a new week here, there's going to be some important kind of shifts in some of the discussion we had last week. So we better get into this. The first thing is that uh, we've been watching for a while on the forecast models, the development of this tropical system off of the southeast coast. Remember, I was a bit you know, confused, I think, when looking at the forecast, whether or not this was going to have full-on tropical characteristics or be more of one of those hybrid systems where there's still a cool upper-level core to it. But regardless of that, we need to watch how much precipitation will be coming from what is now known as Tropical Depression Number 8, could be named Helene uh, later on today. We'll talk more about that in a second. Still cloud cover left over from Francine, and we're going to look at the total rainfall amount here. But watch this next deep low coming into California right there. It's going to really drop the temperatures off. We're actually going to see a, a, a sequence of these this week, some of which could be cold enough to put down snow in the Sierra Nevada mountains. But this is going to become a pretty consistent feature of these um, storm systems that are entering the northwest. And that's going to be large storm complexes, big, you know, big, you know, late, late summer, early fall thunderstorms popping up here in the plains. And we're going to watch one of these systems eventually get into the upper Midwest to deliver some much needed rainfall into this area. And that's also going to be a big theme of this particular discussion is the precipitation patterns as they have been versus where they are going. And uh, there's going to be some places that are going to be left very dry in this pattern. So this is the last week in total. We now have a good idea on um, how Francine, uh, you know, kind of moved through the uh, lower Mississippi Valley, made that turn back toward the southeast. We can see the WPC did a really good job on picking up that heavy rainfall band. Remember, a lot of the other models were bouncing this around. So, for example, this location here uh, in northern Georgia at one point last week had a forecast of over eight inches of rain from one of the models, the European model. So it did flip around. Farther to the north, this rainfall did not extend as far north as we thought it could. And uh, we watched it kind of shrink back in each new forecast that came out. And that's one of the reasons why we just pay attention to these same sequence of maps um, every every time we, we do these forecasts. But we've already seen some pretty heavy rainfall getting into the uh, Carolina coast here. We're going to see a, quite a bit more in this whole corridor here through you know, the northwest, even dipping into California, but really ejecting into Montana, eventually the Dakotas and the upper Midwest. That's going to be an area that, that sees some change. And we've already seen some of these storms, they've been pretty potent just in the last seven days, just kind of having a quick zoom in here to where we've seen some hail out of these storms recently. And my neighbors just went on a trip over toward Rapid City and they got caught in one of these hail stone, uh, storms. Just told me about it last night as they came home. Uh, so certainly been some pretty rough storms in this area. But bigger picture, this is what I think a lot of us are, are discussing right now as we press our way toward harvest, especially in the midsection of the country. If you just take a look the last two weeks on the percent of normal precipitation, and unless you were in central Texas or caught up in uh, Francine's moisture or where the stalled out frontal boundary was in Florida or, or about to get the rainfall from um, you know what could be Helene or in that trajectory here everywhere else I know I just picked out five spots but whatever everywhere else um, has been extremely dry uh, from the Midwest to the Northeast this whole corridor has not seen much precipitation at all in fact you can stretch it back to 30 days for a lot of these places uh, that have been extremely dry now the consequence of this this late in the season is much different than if it was July and I, I know everyone understands that but I'm just making a point here that this late season drop off in moisture and some of these ranks are very low. I mean, just take a look at where I guess very high, given that the higher the number, the drier things are. You know, this has been a major, major, having a major impact on our concerns about going into fall drought that can carry into winter and what that might mean, you know, as we get into next spring. Long story short, if we continue to see these huge deficits in rainfall through fall, once we get into winter, it is very difficult for example, in the Midwest to break a drought in winter. It just tends to last all the way until spring, and we have to rely on those late February, March, and April rains to break through a drought, which they can, but it just gets us concerned about what that might mean going forward. And one of the big discussion points I heard over the weekend in the midsection of the country was about soil moisture. So if we just have a look here at the latest 40 centimeters, that's 16-inch uh, soil moisture data from NASA. Remember, this is a percentile. We have large sections of the, um, you know, of the Missouri Basin, the Mississippi Basin, and the Ohio Basin that are extremely low. And if we go deeper than that, um, you can see down here at 100 centimeters, about 40 inches, you know, the, the just how um, how depleted the soil is right now. And I did uh, on Twitter just follow someone in Indiana was talking about uh, doing some trenching to lay down some tile, and they went down to eight feet. 
and still have not found anything but powdery soil. So this is a problem. And the, the curiosity I have is how much of an impact did that have on the tail end of these crops? Because you know we saw in August some very large uh, yield numbers being reported. And if we pulled back anything on that crop, it is important for us to take note of here in the Midwest. So I know I'm focusing a lot on this area, but that is just, um, that's been a, a kind of a front of mind story for me. On top of that, uh, Francine's moisture, of course, did fall in the lower Mississippi basin. And we've been paying attention to the Mississippi levels. This morning, the river is up about two feet from where it was last week. It's now only 5.77 feet below low stage. But the reality is that was all we were anticipating out of Francine. We have to have more rain on the headwaters to make up for these huge deficits in the Missouri, the Ohio, and the mid and upper Mississippi in order to undo um, the, the, the major drops in the Mississippi River. So we've got to keep a close eye on that as we go forward. Now we have a setup that could be conducive to helping. And what I mean by that is, just like we talked about last week, our source region is in the contrast of the very hot water that we have here and the very cold water that's in place here. This is where we continue to develop lows. They kind of find their way into the west coast like this deep one you see here, and they're trying to make this turn. And that's going to help to increase rainfall chances as we press through this week more and more over the Western Corn Belt, as an example, over the plains, over the upper Midwest. You know, this whole corridor in through here uh, has a better and better chance. But uh, we still have, you know, a bit of an issue with this pattern. And that is that downstream of these deep troughs, we have flow like you see here. There's clearly a ridge that's in place here with a low farther to the south. There's a trough in this location and there's a weak low pressure system here, tropical in, in origin for the most part, which may become named Helene later today. And this is a this is a block pattern. It's not technically, I gotta be careful with that word. It's not a block uh, in the true sense of it being stuck for 10 days, but it's not a pattern that wants to move west or east. It wants to just stay. And so these troughs keep following this direction till we can finally get one of them to push a bit farther into the upper Midwest later this week. So that seems to be where this pattern is right now. And we're going to just again look at the bigger drivers like the WPO and La Nina and all these things and stretch it out as far as we can as we work our way toward uh, the end of this video. But next, I think it's important that we just dive back into the upper level height pattern. All right. So as we play through the rest of today into Tuesday, okay, what did you see? Another trough digs. The first one ejects. This is the tropical low. Uh, it still has a little bit of a cool upper level pattern to it, but whatever. That's moving into the Carolinas and it's going to get kind of left in the lurch. You say, why? Well, this, there's a lot of high pressure to the north of it. There's no reason for it to move. So here we are on Wednesday, getting out till Thursday and Friday, and it's still there. See this? So we need to watch that uh, precipitation pattern carefully. Uh, then we have another system. So this would already be the third low that we're gonna have this week by Friday coming back into Southern California. And it's expected to go right over uh, the Midwest, Western Corn Belt through the plains. We need to look at that precip. And by this upcoming Monday, we are back to where we've been. A low came out of the Bering Sea. It's now in the Gulf of Alaska. And we're just gonna have to watch where that one goes. Does it dig as deep as some of the others do? And some of the story here suggests that maybe it doesn't. You know, through next week, that low may target more of the Pacific Northwest and more of British Columbia rather than diving down into California and coming out. So there is a little bit of a, of a change in the pattern as we get toward the end of this month. And we're going to look at that more carefully in a few moments. But I do want to point out that at the end of the month, the 27th, 28th, 29th, the um, European Artificial Intelligence is attempting to develop another Caribbean, you know, Yucatan, Bay of Campeche low. Uh, and this is certainly going to be one that needs to be watched. I think this is still a very active corridor for tropical systems to develop because I think this is where anything that's going to get to the U.S. other than TD8, which is also, I think, later today be called Helene. I think other than that, um, the Bermuda High's far kind of eastward trajectory or uh, location right now means we're going to be pushing systems out to the open ocean. So that's the pattern through the next couple of weeks. I think it will oscillate quite a bit. I'm not convinced that it's stuck the way the models are currently saying, but I want to show you kind of a progression of precipitation anomaly maps. And so this is the next five days. So we know there's the deep low here that's going to go straight out. So Montana, this is the one that could start to increase some of the Red River Valley of the North precip. And we're going to watch for storms all along the way here. This is mostly from TD8, could be named Helene, that could come in and move around in the Carolinas. 
But outside of that, there's a pretty large corridor in through here that's, let me draw that a little better, that's probably not gonna get much precipitation at all out of this pattern for the next five days. By the time you add on day seven to that, so six and seven, that's the next low coming out of the plains I mentioned. And we just take it all the way out. That's a 10 day forecast for precipitation anomalies from the high resolution uh, European model. So I still continue to see an area that has been very dry lately, staying dry. And that's gonna be a concern if you look out here at this pattern coming up. Okay, so where are we early this morning? We have flood watches out for uh, along the, the Carolina coast. Some stronger winds are expected here. Also strong winds coming around the base of that deep low that's in California. We do have the uh, winter weather advisory out for the Sierra Nevadas. And we're gonna watch this system just roll straight toward this direction over the next couple of days. Before we get there though, I wanna give you the update on TD8. So Gordon is staying out to open ocean. It was at one point a tropical storm, but it's it's not doing much now. But TD8, let's go ahead and have a look at the latest warning cone uh, from the National Hurricane Center. So you do see the S inside of the black dot representing that the National Hurricane Center expects us to get up to tropical storm strength as it comes into the South Carolina coast. And from now to Wednesday, you know, the three day outlook, it's not moving much. And so we're gonna watch the potential for some heavy rain here. Some of the models actually wanna push it in and just kind of abandon it or let it roll back out. The GFS is really undecided on where this could potentially go. Other models are trying to bring it up the coast a bit up here toward New Jersey. In fact, I'm going to New Jersey tonight, looking forward to talking to our East region tomorrow uh, in, uh, in East Brunswick here. So, but we're gonna watch this, uh, you know, we're gonna watch this system carefully to see how much rainfall it can deliver into this region. So we do have out right now a slight risk for excessive rainfall. This is the type that can easily cause flash flooding and more widespread flooding. We'll get the totals in a moment. But I do wanna point out that there is the risk of stronger storms with this coming in as well. So today we gotta to keep an eye on this part of the Northern Plains. We'll watch this wave leave and possibly deliver some strong storms for corner states. And then as we get into tomorrow, you know, the threat is gonna to continue to be along the first system's frontal boundary here and around what should be named Helene. And then remember, there's another wave, the one that follows it immediately <clears throat> here into parts of Montana uh, and back into the high plains. So this will be the, the, uh, the, the new outlook we're gonna be paying attention to um, for the risk of those severe storms with that second wave. Okay, let's get an idea about all of this with the high res model. So this is where the tropical depression later this morning could be upgraded to be named Helene. And we're gonna watch as that heavy rain moves right along, could be right along the border here, uh, the heaviest rain between the Carolinas. As we work our way into this afternoon to this evening, you'll see a lot of deep convection in the mountains again. So you can see these stronger storms and then watch right here in Southern Manitoba, getting into North Dakota toward the Red River tonight for the risk of some stronger storms as well. Now, meanwhile, this precip may press all the way over the Appalachian Mountains into Tennessee and Western Kentucky, or Eastern Kentucky, excuse me. And we're gonna see where that moisture ends up as we play our way into Thursday, excuse me, Tuesday afternoon and evening. Now we don't often rely on that high res NAM to give us a really good simulation of where this could be, but still spreading some rainfall, you know, by Tuesday evening in parts of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and possibly even a bit farther to the north and west around it. That means Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. While that's happening, remember we now have our kind of tandem low, the one that's digging and the one that's ejecting. And this is where we're gonna keep an eye out for the risk of very heavy rainfall, hail, straight line winds, and then you can see the frontal boundary straight, uh, kind of putting a stripe right here through uh, you know, the Western Dakotas into central Nebraska. We're gonna pay attention to where that boundary moves east as this low curls up into Montana and provides some pretty widespread rainfall and snow into the mountains. So given that that's the next you know, three days or so, it gets us to midday Wednesday, Let's now have a look at seven day maps. So that combination of lows coming through Montana, we could potentially have pushing up against the foothills here, three to four inches of rainfall. And as this system at the end of this time period, this seven day time period ejects here, we have the potential in the Western Corn Belt, upper Midwest, all the way back into the central plains of grabbing another inch plus of rainfall. Take a look over here in the Carolinas. The potential is quite high for one to two, maybe three inches of rainfall. Along the coast, there could be a couple of areas, I'm thinking like near Wilmington, that may be able to pick up six, seven inches of rain out of this, just given if the bands of heaviest rain stay over the top of it. 
And we always ask, is there model agreement? So this is the NBM, very similar forecast. This is the latest from the artificial intelligence. It does have a little bit of a difference in where the heaviest rains are gonna be. But again, I wanna point something out really important here. The AI nailed Francine. It was the first to pick up on one of these waves moving out into the Midwest and was also the model that started to show the drop in pressure first for Helene. So I, I'm, I'm liking the AI, but it's very different. Look at the difference here. If I go from the AI back to the WPC, if you are in uh, Montana, look at that. See where it's putting the heavier rainfall, the changes? It's the same thing for the Midwest. So while I find that the artificial intelligence picks up on a pattern earlier, I'm not overly reliant on it for precip totals. I'm just not. It's it's not. Uh, it's leaving much to be desired with that. And I think it's a resolution thing. We need to probably run it in an ensemble mode. There's a lot of things that can be done with it. But boy, adding it in as a fifth model has been very, or sixth actually, has been great. So now we're back to the, you know, the, the dynamical runs, not the statistical. And you're back to that same look, right? Doesn't that look very similar to the, you know, the other forecast models? That's the European high res. And then here finally is the uh, GFS. So one of the reasons why the WPC is so aggressive on the heavier rains here is because the European, the GFS, the NBM, they're all wetter in this corridor. It's only the artificial intelligence that's a bit different. But as you look out there over the next seven days, just compare this map to what I showed you earlier with what the last few weeks have looked like. And there's a lot of zeros in places that had zeros for the last several weeks. So we need to take this and kind of watch it piece by piece. Um, I've almost finished writing the code to do the combinations to be able to see the European against the GFS again. But as we play this forward, we're watching through Tuesday now into Wednesday. That's Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon and evening. Watch that deep low just spin up there through Thursday night, gets into Manitoba, drags its front over the upper Midwest, Western Corn Belt, Thursday night into Friday. And all the while, this is still some of the remnants of, uh, of Tropical Depression 8 or Helene still sitting over here. That's what I meant. It's not moving anywhere, but it's only around there for about five or six days. Then there's the next low that dips in. This would be Sunday. And that one goes right over the top of the same area. And then remember, we kind of changed the trajectory into next week with more of British Columbia, coastal Washington getting hit by the flow. See it? And that change takes us all the way out there to uh, about a 10-day forecast in the model. Now we need to do a bit more than just that. So let's go ahead and have a look at a couple other factors like the snowfall. The seven day snowfall totals, we're gonna to get some snow in the Sierra Nevadas, some of the high elevations in Nevada, and then some of the Rockies here could have the potential for picking up plenty of snow given how cold this is gonna be. And the winds with this are gonna be quite strong as well. With each system that comes in, we're gonna see increased chances of bringing some strong winds out of the Great Basin into the plains. I mean, we could get in Montana over the next 10 days, multiple chances at 30, 40, 50 mile an hour wind gusts. Same thing for the Western Plains. Meanwhile, if you're along the Mississippi here, the Ohio River Valley, these systems are not getting to us. And as a result, relatively benign conditions overall, drier forecast overall, unless we can get one of these fronts to sweep through and bring in a chance for rainfall. But overall, you saw, I mean, let's go back to it again. That's the seven day outlook for total precip. And I, li I like the WPC. I think it's a good product put out by the National Weather Service and a very useful one of seeing you know, rainfall out that far. But uh, if we did do this, let's just open this in a new tab because I want to zoom in there close and show you the southeast. Whoops, sorry about that. Let's click there. And this is going to look at what these winds are expected to be in the Carolinas. So some 40 to 50 mile an hour gusts are possible out of um, Tropical Depression 8 or Orhaline as it comes in. All right, back to the probabilities on rainfall. This is the new European ensemble chance at an inch. So you can see the color bar. We can find our, our wettest corridors. Uh, let's go find the dry spots next. Let's say who's going to be under a tenth of an inch. Yep, got a new model run in. There we go. Let's take this back out. That is your probability map for under a tenth of an inch. And now you can see that arrow I drew earlier right in through there. That's our drier corridor over the next... Um, you know, over the next 10 days. I guess you could also include part of the southeast in here. Columbia Basin is drier too. But if we look back on the wetter side, there's the one inch, two inch, 
and we have the chance. There's a better than 50% chance in here of two inches of rain, according to the European Ensemble in the next two days, and these much higher amounts here shown up in the ensembles as well. And let's go on up to four inches. And now we can really kind of see here that parts of the southeast, you know, we've really got, um, you know, the risk of, of some very heavy rains along the Carolina coast and in there to the border between North and South Carolina. All right, from this point forward, I want to give you an update on something I'm watching in the tropics. I have seen some model runs attempting to do something in the Caribbean, something here pushing toward the Yucatan Peninsula over the next 10 days. And I just want to think about what this might mean. We've already seen that the Gulf of Mexico is very capable of, of building systems. I mean, Francine's our latest example. And if we do get something in here, just need to watch if it goes here or if it comes into Florida. But I still think there is something to be paying attention to down in the uh, Gulf of Mexico and in the Caribbean. So let's watch that carefully over the next 10 days together. From here, uh, let's look at the week two pattern. You can start to see that some of the models like the European, the artificial intelligence and the GFS are all pointing at something, bringing some tropical moisture in this area. The artificial intelligence, so take a look at this forecast for the week two time frame. It's very aggressive on increasing the rainfall totals in the central part of the United States. I mean, that's quite different from the European ensemble, right? I mean, we still have the wetter conditions here possible. I'm still calling this into question, given that we've not been able to get rain to budge in this area for a while. But, uh, you know, uh, is there something consistent there? The GFS has it as well. But boy, that's a big difference for Texas given that the artificial intelligence is really working hard to deliver something out of the Gulf late into week two. So we're going to watch that carefully. All right. So before I stretch this out farther with precip, I want to take a moment to talk about temperatures because this is what the front half of September's look like. I know that some of us in the Midwest, you know, and up the East, you know, this corridor has been warm lately, but that's not enough to offset the really cool air we saw earlier in the month. The West has been extremely hot, but we're about to flip this whole pattern on its head. In fact, it's already started where much colder air is coming into the west, and this is all warmed up significantly. Very hot start down here if you're south of that boundary in uh, Florida. Frost potential over the next seven days, it's all in the west where the deep troughs are, are coming through, and our high temperatures look like this. So 70s, can't get out of the 70s in the Central Valley, but we're well into the 80s all the way up to the Great Lakes here. That's Tuesday's highs. Remember, this will be the quarter. We're going to watch for severe weather on Tuesday. This is Wednesday. Thursday, still hot in the central United States, but the next troughs are still here. So quite cool in the west, Friday into Saturday and Sunday. This is only cool because of cloud cover. This is where the deep lows keep coming in. And in the middle, a lot of heat. And that's why if you just look at it kind of in chunks, you know, still very warm. Just sticking here, moving a little bit farther to the east and even farther. Um, the European model out there day 10 through 15 um, is trying to show some cooler air in the plains here. But we haven't sh kind of shooken ourselves free or shake, shaken, whatever the word is. We haven't loosened ourselves from this pattern of deep lows in this area. It's just that's not happened yet. So this is still what's contributing to the overall pattern. That's that WPO signal. And we end up putting a ridge here. There's a complementary one over in Russia. This whole pattern is being repeated uh, in Europe right now as well. So let's think about the longer range and where this might go and talk a little bit of international weather too. We are continuing to see better and better La Nina type evidence in the pattern. I mean, look right here. For the last uh, month, we've seen these trade winds really begin to pick up steam. And, and they're there. And that's one of the reasons why we've got more cold water upwelling. But to be honest, this is, this is important. But it's becoming more and more important as we work our way toward fall, late fall into winter. La Nina becomes a bigger factor then. What I still think is driving this pattern is the cold water you see here being churned up by deep lows and the very high pressure to the south of it underneath this, you know, underneath that you have this very warm ocean that's just driving lows that are doing something like this across North America. And that seems to just be where it is. But La Nina is going to become a factor soon. And I just want you to see that now this morning, the ocean temperatures are now at 0 0.85, 0 0.85 degrees Celsius below average. That is technically a, a, a firm La Nina signal. But remember, even though you have the cold ocean temperatures, the atmosphere's response sometimes takes time. And so we're, we're, we're going to have to just wait, I think, till later in the fall, getting into winter before we get a full-on La Nina signal if we do. 
Okay, I'm coming back to my same story last week until I have something to break it. And what I see here is that the WPO wow, makes a little bit of a drop here. Uh, around the 21st, we see another surge toward the end of the month. And we're going to spend the rest of, of the month of, of September with a positive West Pacific oscillation. So I'm going to show it to you again. This is what typically happens. And I think we're going to be seeing something like this. I would just make an adjustment. It seems like toward the end of the month, instead of these lows coming into California, like the one is right now, I think it comes more to British Columbia. And and that's this is being supported by the WPC's forecast. So you can see that what I showed here, okay, look, look at the pattern I've drawn here, is now reflected in the end of September, beginning of October outlook from the, w, or from the CPC. Let's blow that up a little bit, sorry. So this, this makes sense to me if the West Pacific Oscillation continues to dominate. So I, I makes sense. So you can even see it in the European. So you, you got here that the European weeklies, the big change though is maybe more of the trajectory of the storm systems that are originating here in more British Columbia. So we do see a drier pattern. This will be the most challenging thing to forecast. The reason for that being we, I still think there's more developing in the Caribbean and in the Gulf that could come into the southern U.S. coastline here. So that's a 31 day or 30 day outlook all the way through October, looking at precipitation and temperature wise, you're just going to see more mild here because that cold air is locked away in this area and it just keeps coming into the West. Now, remember at some point in October, you can't outdo the shorter and shorter days. And some of that cold air will get in and give us a frost event that'll hit the Midwest. But as you saw a moment ago, when looking at the temperature patterns, there's not like a, there's not a whole lot of evidence that any of that's coming anytime soon. So what happens as we transition more toward a La Nina-like pattern? Well, this is likely what's going to happen. This is a correlation map for October through December on precipitation with ENSO, which is El Nino in the Southern Oscillation. Where you see the blues, that actually represents where there's a better chance of being wetter because the correlation is negative. And when it's negative, that means La Nina makes this wetter. This does mean that a lot of the cotton belt and the corn belt and the wheat belt, the central U.S., this is a region that we could be struggling through all along the south and in the central U.S. with drought development this fall if La Nina is the dominant force in this pattern. The temperature pattern looks something like this. And what it shows is wherever you see the warmer colors, that is actually the risk of being cooler, okay? Because you have to take the opposite of it because we have La Nina. So the correlation is, you have to take the inverse, okay? So this means this whole region could slide into a bit of a cooler late fall, early winter. There's some evidence of an earlier start to winter. We didn't even have a winter last winter. So anything that points toward cooler conditions in this area is what we're seeing. We tend to be more mild where the bluer colors are more mild down here in the Southern Plains the Southwest. So IRI, this would be the uh, NOAA's kind of forecasting arm that's through Columbia University. They, they partner, you know, they put out the new CPC forecast and they've upped it again. So late fall, early winter, you know, November, December, January, 83% chance of having La Nina dominate. So we're going to continue to build the story. I showed you last week, multiple times, the European model solution and the, um, National Multimodel Ensemble. We'll get new data later this week, so we'll be sure to include that as well. But the last couple of things I want to show you is maybe how in the near term and in the long term, how the planet's going to respond. So as I said, we've got this repeating pattern. There's a low here and there's a low there. There's a ridge here and there is a ridge there. And that's the repeating pattern, sorry, over um, North America. But across the rest of the world, South America are quite warm right now, uh, but the precipitation pattern remains quite dry throughout much of Brazil. Now, in um, Australia, I'm looking forward. I got to talk to a group here on Wednesday. Boy, look at this precipitation pattern here. This is where the MJO is stalled out right now. And holy cow, it's moving a lot of moisture through that area. But in terms of South American rainfall, not a whole lot of difference from our story from last week. Still wetter in southern Brazil. Some places very wet. This is a problem. This is too much precipitation in places. Farther to the north, we're quite dry. But this, as I finish up, is maybe one of the more important transitions we've seen. You go back 10 runs ago, what did I tell you through mid-October was going to happen? I said, man, the European model was wet. Even five model runs ago, European model was wet. Well, this morning's model run or the latest one that came in yesterday, it is not as wet through middle of October. 
Now, this is not yet at the alarming point that I'm like, whoa, 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 big time drought settling in here. I, I still think we get a monsoon that starts and allows them to plant on time. But the European model did back off on how wet it was projecting things in this area. And now you start to see just a slight drier signal in this region. Now, is this anything to make a story out of? I don't think it is yet. I really don't think it is yet. They'll plant 80% of that soybean crop in the month of October. I'm, I'm not convinced that we have to be like, oh, they're going to have a terrible start. No, there's still moisture in this. It's not as though there is no rainfall, but when you look at these anomalies, it looks drier. But let me just show you the totals. You know, there's the chance that by the time we get to the third week of October, places have already picked up two to three inches of rainfall, and that's what they're waiting on. This is the problem. If this continues, these are major planting delays and problems in southern Brazil. I mean, that right now is an outlook through October 21st, you know, looking at six to seven, maybe eight inches of total rainfall in that area. And that's going to cause flooding. That's going to cause major delays. And we got to keep an eye on this. But the more important month, for, or excuse me, more important region for October is right in through here. So just wanted to keep you aware of, of what we're seeing here in the longer range forecast models and some of these trends. But I'll, with that, I'll stop. So you have a good week. I'll talk to you tomorrow morning early from uh, New Jersey. Till then, you have a good one. Thanks.